verse 1 says, And after these things, Paul departed from Athens. And just by the way of slight commentary, if you're familiar with Paul and his Athenian ministry, you know, the people of Athens, were all, they, they all set out to hear some new thing. And one of the most powerful sermons that Paul preached, he preached in Athens at a place called Mars Hill. And what's interesting is that one of his most powerful recorded sermons in Scripture reaped very little, if no fruit. Nobody got saved in Athens. And when Paul left Athens, and we're going to see in our text, he traveled to Corinth, it was about a 150-mile journey. The interesting note is, because of the Athenians, because they rejected the gospel, over 300 years passed before a church was established in Athens. Athens was called the, uh, the center for learning. It was considered to be one of the most, the center of intellect, one of the most... Um, powerful intellectual places in the world. Athens was the capital of intellect. And yet in the capital of intellect, men was, were, were, were guilty of doing the silliest thing that a man could do. And that is men were worshiping gods of their own making. And uh, Brother Edmund, I didn't even realize that you were here today. God bless you. God bless you. Work, worshiping gods of their own making. And anytime you worship a god that you made, something's wrong with that, isn't it? There's something wrong with that. So that was going on in Athens. And, and so they came to Corinth, and Corinth was the capital of Greece uh, in Paul's day. The proconsul of Rome lived there. So it was a powerfully, uh, a, a city that was powerful in the p political world, and it was a city that needed Jesus. So verse 2 says, And he found certain Jews named Aquila and, and uh, born of Pontos, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because that Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. Claudius by now had put the Jews out of Rome. So Priscilla and Aquila sailed from Rome to um, uh, Greece and went to Corinth. And Paul met them there. And verse 3 says, And because he was of the same craft, they were, they were leather technicians. He abode with them and wrought for, wrought for by their uh, occupation, they were tent makers. So they made tents. He worked with them because they had this in common. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks in the synagogue, he, he went to the synagogue every Sabbath day after making tents all week long and reasoned with both the Jews and the Greek, that is, the Hebraic Jews and the Hellenistic Jews. The, the phrase Hellenize, it means that these were Jews who spoke Greece, Greek, and they were very educated. The Hebraic Jews were very educated also, but they were educated in the Hebrew doctrine. The Hebraic Jews were, uh, we would call them the more conservative Jews, and they were the more orthodox Jews, and they, they, they were sticklers to Judaism. And so they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. The Hellenized Jews, they spoke multiple languages, and they were more given to idolatry, and they were not as, they, they were not strict adherents to Judaism, and they didn't believe that Jesus was Lord either. So Paul had to persuade both of these sets of Jews, these people, every 
Saturday in the synagogue, he went in and did spiritual warfare, evangelistic work, uh, convincing them that Jesus was Lord. The scripture says he reasoned with them. You know, people say, I don't debate the Bible. Paul did. He reasoned with them. They went back and forth, scripture for scripture. And most of the time when you hear people say that they don't debate the Bible, that's because they don't know the scripture. See, when you know the scripture, then you will reason the scripture. Someone says, well, the, the, the truth doesn't need defending. It does. It does. It does. The Lord needs, want people who know the truth to speak up and say what needs to be said. Amen. The only thing that is necessary, one man said, for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. Or for good men to say nothing. Are you with me? And when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, they came... And joined Paul. He had left them in uh, Macedonia. Uh, they came and joined him. Uh, Paul was pressed in the spirit. What actually happened is when they came from Macedonia, they brought him an offering from the church at Macedonia. And with the offering that they brought him, it encouraged him. And I tell you what it did. It gave him the ability to leave tent making for a while because he was being supported by the church. And the Bible tells us that Paul was pressed in the spirit. The word pressed there literally means that he was encouraged. So when these two men arrived and brought him a gift, that encouraged him and revived him. And I'm telling you, you need to pray for the pastor. You need to pray for the ministers. You need to pray for all who do battle in the name of the Lord. Pray for the happy warriors. Pray for people who are on the front lines. Because when you are doing battle for the Lord, you are battling. Satan is battling back with demon spirits. Satan is always coming against you. Constantly trying to tell you that you're not doing anything. You're not saying anything. Nobody's paying you any attention. You may as well give up. Sometimes he will attack your body. Dr. Robert Foster is doing a tremendous job, a stellar job in exposing the truth behind the wicked yoga. But I want you to know that since he's been agreed to do this at my uh, 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 request and uh, the enemy has attacked his body. The enemy has afflicted him because them demons, the demons of Kundalini, the, the god of yoga, one of those many gods that's a part of that wicked behavior. It's wicked to, wickedness to the core. And he's not exposing yoga according to the doctrines of Christianity, but he's exposing yoga according to the doctrine of yoga. The Hindu religions that it comes from teaches us and tells us that these people are, these, these positions that are being assumed are positions to false gods. And you have no business doing that. Christians shouldn't be participating in that at all. And those spirits don't like, don't like for the truth. They're upset that the truth is being revealed and they have attacked his body, but they won't win. They won't win. Amen. They won't win. And so you need to pray for us. Pray for the, pray for the pastor. Call my name in prayer. Because the enemy is always coming to try and discourage us. But when they came, they encouraged Paul. And, and he, was, he was pressed in the spirit and testified. Look at this. He testified uh, to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Now, verse 4 talked about how he reasoned with them. But after his help came and some encouragement came, said he testified that Jesus was the Christ. He stepped it up and he uh, was quite successful. And when they opposed, look at this, when, and when they opposed themselves and, and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, your blood be upon your heads. I'm, I am clean from henceforth. I will go to the Gentiles. When the Jews resisted the gospel, they resisted the truth. He didn't just keep trying to tell them. He said, you know what? I'm done with you. God gives us a certain amount of time to catch on. Amen. Catch on. You, some of you, 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 you're too slow. Catch on. Need too much attention. Catch on. Grow in grace. 
need too many meetings. Hear the same gospel. Everybody else hears and grab hold to it and apply that word. Amen. Those people rejected the word of God and Paul said, I am done with you. And he walked out, the Bible says in verse 7, and he departed thence. He left the synagogue, but he didn't go far. And entered to a certain man's house named Justice. That is, he walked right out of the synagogue. Notice this, it says, named Justice. Justice was a Gentile, one that worshiped God and whose house joined hard to the synagogue. Paul walked out of the synagogue, went next door to Justice's house and said to Justice, can I set up my church in your house? And Justice said, yes. So he walked out the synagogue, went next door and went to Justice's house and began to preach there. And guess what happened? A revival broke out at Justice's house. Next door to the synagogue. Isn't that something? And while the revival, you know, nothing was going on in the synagogue and God was moving by his spirit at Justice's house. It was such a move of God. Verse 8 says that Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, the head Jew, the chief ruler, the, the chief ruler of the synagogue was also in charge of service, making sure everything took place. Uh, he was the main person in terms of making sure the services started on time and that everything was in place. Now, of all the people, you wouldn't have expected him to leave the synagogue and go check out what's happening at Justice's house. But he left and he walked into Justice's house and look at what happened to him. The Bible says, and believed on the Lord. With all of his house. He got saved. Went home and told his wife, honey, I'm different. She got saved. The children saw the change in the parents. And they got saved. You're talking about a revival. And you're talking about a trophy. They won the chief <laughs> priest. Chief ruler of the synagogue. They got saved. Believed and was baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul. In the night. By a vision. He said this. Number one. Be not afraid. Secondly. But speak. And hold not thy peace. For I am with thee. And no man. Shall set on thee. To hurt thee. For I have. Much people. In this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. For your consideration, forgive me for my lengthy explanation of the text. The Lord said to him, speak, verse 9, and hold not thy peace. I want to preach today from this subject. I won't shut up. Everybody shout, I won't, I won't. Shut, up. shut up. Father, bless us now as we preach the word of God in Jesus' name, amen. I won't shut up. Oh, maybe I won't be quiet or I won't be silent anymore. There are probably better ways to say it, but that's the way the Lord gave me to say it. I won't shut up. Keep preaching, keep declaring God's truth. Amen? This message on this um, Vision Keepers Sunday is going to bless and challenge all of us who are given the task to speak up for the Lord. This message today deals with the biblically predicted assault on speech that is taking place in this country and around the world. The Bible predicted that there would be an assault on free speech, an assault on speech, the truth. Let me, before I go any further, let me just read the very first amendment to you. 
Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment, an establishment of religion. Congress will make no law dealing with any house of worship or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging, to abridge is to shorten, or abridging the freedom of speech. This is our First Amendment right. We should be able to freely talk to one another. To have conversations. Freedom of speech or of the press or the right uh, to the right of the people uh, to peacefully uh, to assemble themselves. And to petition the government for a regress of, gr of grievance. The point is, our First Amendment right is the right to have free speech. The Apostle Peter said this about uh, the attack on free speech. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. Second Peter 3 and 3. Also Jude verse 18 says, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. In both scriptures, they speak of scoffers. One scripture speaks of scoffers, the other of mockers. And it mentions ungodly lusts. That is, these people will have their own agenda. Lust. See, one of the problems we have in the church is when we read the word lust, we always narrow it down to sexual lust. But lust is not always about sex. There are people who have wicked agendas. Things that they want to get passed uh, into law and all kinds of things. We've witnessed of late the legislation of immorality. People tell me, well, you can't legislate your morality. Well, America of late have been legislating immorality. Amen. Same-sex marriage is immoral. And yet we took immorality and made it into law. You don't hear what I'm saying. A scoffer and a mocker is a person who ridicules you. A, to scoff at is to uh, make a mockery of. To, to make a mockery of somebody is to make fun of them, them. It is to shame them. The purpose of the scoffer and the mocker is to silence you. Have you afraid to speak up for fear of being made fun of, for fear of being ostracized, for fear of of being criticized. Their weapon of choice uh, is ridicule. I'm not going to say anything because if people knew that I felt this way, they would talk about me. If you happen, if you dare admit that you're not sold on the doctrine of global warming as it is presented, the notion that man has caused all of this. I personally believe that what's going on is what the Bible said would happen. The Bible says the whole creation groaneth for the manifestation of the sons of God. The Bible teaches that when sin is rampant in the earth, that even the earth groans and mourns. I believe that if you want to get an electric car, you can if you want to, you know, get your solar energy, you can. But nothing is going to stop what we're seeing happen today until people get right with God. You can't live a wicked life and carry on in a wicked way and, and think uh, that uh, changing cars, getting an electric car is going to solve that problem. 
the whole creation, the Bible says, mourneth and groaneth for the manifestation of the children of God. But if you don't, if you don't toe the line on what they are saying to you about global warming today, and uh, if you don't go along with it, they, then you get labeled, ridicule. You get labeled as a uh, science denier. So-and-so doesn't believe in science. Or he's a fool. He doesn't believe in science. Or if you believe that marriage is a, is a, uh, 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 a union between a man and a woman, you get labeled. So, oh, he's homophobic. He's homophobic. Now, uh, and, and stuff like that. So when you take a stand, have you noticed? Have you noticed we're in a day now where we're in a day of labels? Labels. Labels. I mean, we can just rattle them out. He's homophobic, xenophobic, thisophobic, thatsophobic. We ought to write a song on all these phobias. See? Amen. And so what, what, what these titles are designed to do, they are designed to silence you. See, no human being likes being mocked. No human being likes being ridiculed. Praise the Lord. It's, it's just easier to just uh, keep your thoughts to yourself. See, the mocker is not necessarily interested in changing your mind. The mocker is not interested in changing your beliefs. The mocker only wants you to shut up. That's all. The mocker is only interested in your views being expressed if the mocker agrees with your views. But if they disagree with your views, then they will protest. You've seen this on college campuses. They protest. They don't let the speaker speak. Well, the, spe the speaker was a racist or the speaker was this or that. Yes, but I was under the impression that part of the collegiate experience was exposure. Exposure to speech and thoughts and ideas and things that you hadn't heard before and things that perhaps you don't agree with, but you get exposed to it so as to strengthen your own foundation and strengthen your own argument. But today, rather than being exposed to something that we don't like, we fight now to keep that person from speaking. We're late. We, everybody's labeled now. If a white person disagrees with a black person on any issue for any reason. It's got to be. It can't be any other reason other than they're racist. Amen. I was saying something to someone not long ago. I said, do, do you not believe that there are people who have some lifetime sincerely held beliefs? like me, who have believed certain things according to the scripture ever since I got saved in 1977? Should I now let that go because it's popular now to do what is opposite of what I sincerely believe? Does it make me a homophobe or make me judgmental because I agree with God? Could it, could it be that I'm not homophobic? Could it be that I'm not judgmental? Could it be that I just disagree? Yeah. Is there no room for disagreement? Or is it true uh, that because I have a differing opinion, then I must equip myself to deal with the scoffer? And the marker. Either way, I won't shut up. Are you praying for me? I want to read an article, a little bit of an article that was written. Uh, it's from the town hall, townhall.com, posted February the 3rd, 2018, but it was actually written by Kurt. Schlichter, I hope I said his name right. I probably didn't. Originally written in October the 6th, 2016. And I'll just read it as it is, and you'll see why it fits here, and we're going to 
a couple of other areas of scripture and hopefully we're going to shout and get blessed and go home. It says, liberals attempt to silence dissenters will not end well. So, that man in freedom of speech. Uh, there's a Norman Rockwell, I don't know if the guys have it, painting of a man standing in the midst of, that the guy there standing up, Norman Rockwell, you remember Norman. And so he's standing up around people to speak his mind. The name of that painting is Freedom of Speech, the famous Norman Rockwell painting of an American exercising one of the liberals' least favorite rights. He stands up in 2016 and says his piece, and it will not end well. You see, the writer says, to liberals, what our guy has to say isn't important. What's important is to shut him up. It's to punch down upon him with cheap mockery so he's beaten into submission. It's to use shame to silence him and every other unredeemable, deplorable in order to consolidate their progressive death grip upon America's throat. This will not end well. See, a republic with a democratic with democratic features like the United States can't function without the possibility of discussion. It needs citizens to have the ability to rationalize, to rationally debate the issues, to be heard so that they can perceive the process as fair and one where they are equal participants. But that's exactly what liberals with tactics like political correctness and the outright lies of the mainstream media, of course, seek to prevent. They seek to prevent discussion. Discussion can only exist where customs and norms demand that all voices be heard. That, uh, that the point of the opposition are at least characterized as something resembling what they are. If I have a point that differs with your point, then you should at least characterize my point for being what it is rather than uh, calling me a name. See, just allow me to present my side of the argument. Are you following what I'm saying today? And that no one is excluded from participation by the facts that they uh, possess by the facts that they possess views by the fact excuse me that they possess views which the majority or a powerful minority disapproves one of the most powerful minorities in our country is the LBGTQ uh, organization they have invaded media you can't watch a movie I was enjoying, what is it, was a new one, 911. 911. I'm sitting there watching. I said, I like this one. This is a good one. Next thing you know, the sister on that is married to a woman. Lord, you can't, you, they, 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 that's the world. They're trying to push this stuff down your throats. And they don't, they don't represent the majority of persons, of people in our country, but they have a lot of money and they have infiltrated every sphere of society, and, and if you dare say something, it better be an agreement, or else you may lose your job. You remember that brother, that brother named that Isaiah, I forget it, Washington. Uh, he used to be on Gray's Anatomy. Now y'all looking at me, you tell me, preacher, make the word relevant, all right? He was on Gray's Anatomy. 
And he told the man on Gray's Anatomy, what he said was, I didn't call you a faggot. They fired him for that. Now, I don't think they should have fired him for calling the man one. Since the man was one, is one, and he's one now. See, truth don't matter. Took the brother off the show, and you still kept watching it. I ain't watched the episode since then. No, can't do it. Can't, can't, can't do it. Can't do it. Can't do it. This powerful minority boosted for eight years with a president who was in their corner. Decked out the White House in homosexual colors. Wasn't upset when Newsweek magazine placed him on the cover as being America's first they used the word gay, president, talking about President Obama. And he didn't get mad. I would have shot Newsweek. They put me on the, somebody would have been in trouble had they put that on there. Oh yeah, oh yeah. In certain circles, you, you are tarred and feathered, especially on college campuses, if you happen to let it slip out that you believe the Bible, or you are pro-life, and believe that the life of the unborn is sacred. Then you're accused of hating women. The devil is a liar. Instead of that, let me just finish this and preach to you. Instead of that, uh, we have liberal elites that gleefully bludgeon people with opposing views. They bludgeon them into silence. And then pats itself on its collective back for its enlightenment. Yeah, we're smart. We're intelligent. But we beat that silly Bible thumper into silence. This will not end well. Take our guy in the painting. He stands and says, quote, Well, I don't think, well, I don't know about this idea of letting men into ladies' rooms with little girls. And of course, his opposition doesn't even address the very, re the very real problems that come along with allowing grown men into the restrooms with little girls. Facts merely enrage them. So, they won't, so there won't be any discussion of the problem of widows and perverts taking advantage of this idiotic liberal nonsense that this, guy, that this normal guy like many other normal persons would worry about. They don't argue the merits of it. They don't say that it's not good for a man to be in the bathroom with a girl, a little girl, and especially if the man think he's a woman. A man dressed in women's clothing in a bathroom with girls. If you think that that's a bad idea and, and a wicked one like I did, then you get labeled instead of having a rationalized, reasonable discussion. You just get labeled. In, in our state, there are 16,000, in North Carolina alone, 16,000 convicted child sex offenders. In our state, 16,000 convicted. That's the ones that we've caught. Do you think it, it was a, it's a good idea with 16,000, the ones that we've caught, convicted child sex offenders in the state? Do you think it's a good idea to fix the bathroom, to fix the law where if a guy decides when he get up that morning, he's going, you know, I think I'll be a girl today. I think I'm a girl. Yes, I'm a girl. Nothing's changed now. I'm a girl. Whether he put girl clothes on or not, and even if he does, I'm a girl. Do you think, ladies, he should have access to you in a restroom? Or, or if you're enlightened, how about your daughter? How about your little girl? How about your 80-year-old mama? I almost said mammy. How about your mama, 80-year-old mama in the bathroom like that? Do you think it's a good idea? 
like our governor does and many others and the NAACP and many others. They thought it was a good idea and label those who thought it was a horrible idea as being uh, racist, sexist, homophobic, but they would not discuss the merits of the argument. Instead of having a discussion, you get ridiculed. And then after you're being ridiculed, they, dem they demand that you get fired from your job because you have committed the felony of wrong thinking. You, you, almost get, you almost get more time now for not thinking right than for killing somebody. The thought police is alive and well, and they're trying to use ridicule to destroy us, to silence us. Why silence us? The gospel has to be heard. For it to be effective, it must be heard. It must be preached. It must be declared. And what we don't realize is who these people are ultimately after is the preacher. It's the spirit of Antichrist trying to come through the political system and any other way that it can to silence the church because the problem is biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity sanctions the life of the unborn. Biblical, biblical Christianity endorses marriage between a man and a woman. Biblical Christianity speaks against adultery, fornication. Oh yeah, biblical Christianity. Good God Almighty it says, come ye out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. And so what they do to try to silence the preacher from preaching the truth and silence the saints from, from declaring the truth is they accuse us of being, here's another label, judgmental. Oh, I, I don't know why I visited that church. He's so judge, judgmental. Or they don't call us judgmental they, 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 they declare, uh, as one guy came and he left, the, left our church, he visited one Sunday and uh, he's married to a man. And uh, he says, I was at Upper Room and the, the, the hate that, that Bishop wouldn't spew out, I just had to get up and leave, he said. He said, I was spewing out hate. Now, he didn't say what I said. He didn't, he didn't go into what I actually said. He just labeled it. That's, that's mockery. See, broad, but so well, uh, so well, what did he say that was hateful? Well, he said that it's wrong for a man to marry a man. But well, 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 that's not being hateful. The Bible says that. That's not being hateful. That's being biblical. Do you see the problem? That when you say what God said, these mockers get mad. Hear me carefully. I'm, I'm getting ready to tune up. We're getting ready, getting ready to take it home, but I need to lay this down for you. Amen. Are you with me? Hear me carefully. Lot, Lot was a type for the church. Our Lord in Luke's gospel, chapter 17 and verse 28 says, Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. They said they did all these things until the Son of Man came and he took the church out of the world. Okay, Lot is a representative. He's a type for the church. Lot in Sodom. Sodom is a type for the world. Now notice how, listen church, notice how Lot blended in and worked well with the people of Sodom. They worked together like hand in glove. This, even though the Bible said this about the men of Sodom. The Bible says in Genesis 13 and 13, the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Now it's interesting how Lot 
could get along so well with these men who were wicked sinners before the Lord exceedingly. But also remember that Lot is a type for the church. And look how the church now is getting along just fine with the world. We look more like the world now than we look like a church. We sound more like the world than we sound like the church. Some of y'all don't like this preaching today. Oh my. See, this is a recent phenomenon. The church used to stand out like a sore thumb. But of late, the church have sought the world's approval. The church have sought uh, Hollywood's approval. The world loves Joel Osteen. The world gave Bishop Jakes his own TV show. They love preachers who won't preach against them. They love the, the, the aspects of the church who go along with their behavior. Lot did good in Sodom, even though the Bible says in Genesis chapter 18, the 20th verse, and verse 21, the A clause, because the angel said, we got to go down to Sodom. And check it out, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. Now, I just read wicked exceedingly, and very grievous. So, so, so much for all sins being the same. Wicked exceedingly, and very grievous. Now, there is such thing as grievous, not very grievous, but very grievous. Words have meanings. Words have meanings. So now they had to, I'm, I'm going to preach in a minute. And, and uh, so he says, I got to go down and check him out. Now, what Lot didn't get is how his being with them, making money, doing well. What he didn't see was how it was affecting his family. Second Peter chapter 2 verse, tell, verse 7 tells us this. And delivered just, that is righteous Lot. His was Lot's condition when those angels got him out of Sodom. Vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. He was vexed. That word vexed, I mean he was tormented by seeing their filthy lives. And it really affected his family because his daughters, you know, they messed up. Lot had what, two daughters? He had two daughters and both of them were married. And let me tell you something, ladies. The Bible says his daughters had never known man. You know why? Because they married two men from Sodom. And the men said, I don't want you. So you can imagine that they were very frustrated. Lot's wife got messed up. She loved Sodom so much she fell in love. And, and by the way, guys, Lot took his family to Sodom. See, you, you men bring your families to church. Bring them to the house of God. Lot took his son, I mean, took his wife and his daughters to Sodom. Lot did that. Some of y'all, you have no leadership. Take your wife and your family out of a Bible preaching church and go over there so you can wear short pants to church and do nothing. Let me tell you something. You better keep your family in the fire where they can hear the word of the Lord. So, no, we left because we wanted to go and be free over here. All we do is drink coffee in the sanctuary. We play games and we just have, it's good time church, all right? But when the devil takes his toll on your family, just know that you did it. You took them there. Lot took his family down there. The angel told them, says you gotta, listen, the price of your deliverance is very, very low because Abraham been praying for you. All you got to do when I bring you out is don't look back. And Lot's wife looked back. She looked back because what she was leaving, Sodom represents the world, what she was leaving was still in her. And some of us are in the church, but we're looking back. And that's the problem. That's the problem. That's the problem. You're looking back. When the angels told Lot's family, we're leaving tonight, the Bible teaches that they milled around. There was no sense of urgency. They was hanging around. They were vexed. But you know, many of us today are worse off than Lot was. Why do you say that? 
Because the text tells us that Lot was vexed by looking at them, watching them, seeing them interact. We are entertained by them. When we see the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah today, if the person is talented and can sing, we throw a shoe at him. We're entertained by it. Ooh, child. Lot at least was vexed by it. Oh, we're in trouble when, when, let me tell you, the world makes you think that you're smart when you can go out at a restaurant and, uh, and see uh, two uh, perverts, praise the Lord, sitting there. And you, you, you're not supposed to fight anybody, nothing like that. But you look at them and you, you, you pretend to be enlightened, so you act like it doesn't even bother you. Oh, well, this is the year 2018. I don't care if it's the year 3018. The Bible is still right. See, the world will try to make you think that you're, you're enlightened. You're enlightened now because sin doesn't bother you. No, I'll tell you what you are. You're vexed. Praise the Lord. It ought to bother you. And then, you're, then the child, the child know better. The child know better. Daddy, daddy, mommy, mommy. Daddy, daddy, mommy, mommy. Did you see that woman? She just kissed that other woman. Dad. Well, uh, son, uh, uh, we, we don't judge here. And some people just happen to love uh, some, uh, someone else of the same sex. Or that, that guy sitting over there, mommy, mommy, a man. Uh, like, like that woman, uh, the, uh, the lady uh, in uh, uh, Georgia who, who was over the ACLU who, whose daughter was, came out the bathroom one day and she was just messed up. She said, mommy, mommy, I saw two, two or three men in the bathroom and the men was, no, two or three women in the bathroom and the women was talking to each other, but men's voices were coming out of them. The girl was in the bathroom when three transgenders walked in and the child, the child was stunned and she was confused. Now, when her mother heard that, her mother went to the ACLU and said, you know what, we might need to reconsider this. Guess what the ACLU did? What their response was? They began to label her and attack her like they attack people like me. Because when the, all of a sudden, see, when it happened to her daughter, she saw the light. But them people don't care. They don't care. The ridiculers and the mockers, they have their own agenda. And if it destroys you, if it destroys your family, if it destroys your life, they don't care. You're just collateral damage. They want their agenda. And their agenda is to silence the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm preaching good. I'm, uh, now, I know that you would rather hear me preach today some sermon about you getting over your haters and the Lord going to make you rich tomorrow. Well, this will make you rich. It'll make you rich in wisdom and knowledge and in true holiness. And when this service is over, if you want to meet with me, I'll gladly sit down and talk to you. And you sit down. I'll hear you out. Tell me where I'm wrong. Show me where I'm in error. Well, I just believe we should love everybody. Well, show me where what I'm saying is unloving. I believe we should love everyone too. And the greatest act of love is to tell people the truth. Love is not a license. You don't exercise love by going along with everybody, with everything. I love my children. And sometimes that love will manifest it with me doing one of these numbers. Love! Good God Almighty. That's love. love. Sometimes love made me speak soft. Sometimes love made me speak hard. It depends on what they were doing. That's love. You read in the Bible, Jesus didn't just whisper. Mm -mm. Call Herod a fox. Call folk who wouldn't receive the truth dogs. Yes, he did. Call the Seraphonician woman a dog. Yes, he did. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. You'll see that I'm telling you the truth. And I am properly exegeting the text. God Almighty. Yeah, see, Lot, you know why Lot traded off? You know why Lot stayed there? Lot stayed there because the money was good. Because the economy was good. The Bible teaches in Ezekiel 16, 49 and 50, Behold, this is the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. 
pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and, and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hands of the poor and the needy. Sodom didn't care about the poor, but Sodom had money. Sodom had a, a robust economy. And verse 50 says, and they were haughty, they were arrogant, and committed abomination, homosexuality, before me. Therefore, he says, I took them away as I saw good. That's Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49 through 50. See, he stayed there because it worked for him. It made money for him. So many of us, we are, we are denying the Lord because it is, it is to our advantage to say nothing. Yes, I can't get an amen now. Praise the Lord. You, you, you scared to let somebody know I, I, I go to Wooden's church over there. Over there, yes, where well, that preacher said that stuff, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Amen. There's a price to be paid today for standing for the Lord. Preach wouldn't, and uh, it worked for Lot. It worked for Lot. He made money. It worked for Lot. He had a wonderful house. It worked for Lot. It worked. It worked. It worked. Until Lot tried to make a moral stand and tell them what to do. It worked as long as he went along to get along. But the moment he tried to correct them. Oh, and that's the way it is with the world. The world will love us as long as we're fawning over them. Hollywood will love us as long as we're asking the Hollywood star to give us their autograph. The world will love us as long as we go along with the world. But the moment we stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord. That's when the devil gets mad. And that's when the world shows its own true color. The, the, the visitors came to Sodom. Lot saw them and invited them in his house. They said, no, we're going to stay in the streets all night. Lot said, oh, no, not this city. Oh, no, you can't stay in the street here. Read it, read it. Genesis 19 says, please come. Please come to my house. Come into my house. And so he got them in the house. And while he, they were in the house, verse 5 says, and uh, it speaks of, verse 4 says, behold, before they laid down, the men of the city even the men of Sodom come past the house round, both old and young. All of the people from every quarter. Men surrounded the house because they saw new, fresh carriers come to town. Oh Lord. And they came. Oh, I'm in the Bible. And they came out. Look at this. It's not even politically correct to even preach this part of the Bible. See, political correctness causes you to exclude certain portions of Scripture. I'm not excluding any of the Bible. All of the Bible is the Word of God. Yes. I'm going to preach in a minute. Uh, I, I'm, the, the plane is going down the runway. Uh, and. Uh, they, they, the Bible said, and they called out to Lot and said to him, where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out to us that we might know them. They wasn't saying bring them out so we can introduce ourselves. Hello, my name is Frank. What's your name? No, the word you know there is Yada. We want to uh, have sexual intercourse. The Bible said that Adam knew Eve. Same word. And she brought forth sons. Well, these men wanted to have sex with these uh, angels that God sent down to see if the city was as wicked as it was. Bring them out that we may know them. And Lot went out of the door and said unto them, look at this, he, he stepped out and shut the door behind him and said, I pray you, brethren, notice what it says, do not so wickedly. Now, Lot like said, don't, don't do this thing. What you're trying to do to my guests 
is wickedness. That's not politically correct there. He says, behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Both of those girls were married. They have not known man. And let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and you do as uh, you, uh, you do, do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Now you know he was messed up. You know Lot had lived there too long because ain't no way I would offer up my daughter. No way in this world. No way, no how, no day, no where, no, nothing, no, no kind of way. But he, he offered up his own daughters. He, he was messed up and said, do uh, as you want to them. He offered them fresh young women who had not known me. So now two men came who had not known man, and two women were there who had not known man. And these wicked men of Sodom didn't want the women that had not known a man. They wanted the men who had not known a man. The Bible is right. I'm making some of you so uncomfortable. I know what you're saying. Please don't put, please don't put the camera on me. And some of you, some of the reason why it's hurting you is you sitting there thinking about your family member, your aunt, your uncle, your brother, your loved one who may be like that. Well, the Bible is right. Bible don't change for your mother. Bible doesn't change for your father. Bible doesn't change for your niece. Doesn't change for your nephew. The word is what it is and it's settled in heaven. Oh, Lord, let me hurry up here. And I heard, uh, see, that's why I taught the text when I read it, uh, so I wouldn't have to go back to it and preach too long. And I heard him say, uh -huh, he said, do what you will. Offer them women. And, and they said, notice what their, their response was. Verse 8, it says, and they said, talking about the men of Sodom, stand back. Otherwise, they told him, get out of our way. We don't want them women. Get out the way. What kind of man is that? We don't want those girls. Get out the way. Get back. You see that? And they said again. Notice this. This one fellow came in to sojourn. He came to live with us. And we let him. And he's done good with us. And now, look at this, and he will, and he will needs be a judge. Now he's trying to tell us what we can and cannot do. Oh, that's the way it is for you who have cozied up with the world. You who say you have more worldly friends than you have Christian friends. You at home with the world. All right, one day you're going to try to correct them. And when, when you do, then their true colors are going to show. See, God didn't call us. To praise the Lord, blend in. We are the light of the world. The Lord called us to be an example to the lost. The Lord called us to live holy and let the world see Christ in us. They said, this man have come here and now he's trying to judge us. Now we will deal worse with him than with them. See, they knew they were wrong. We're going to do worse with, with, with Lot than with the men. And they pressed sore uh, upon the man. That is, they got, they got close to Lot, even Lot, and they came to break in the door. But what happened was the angels opened the door blinded those men and they pull a lot into safety but the point is once he tried to correct them they tried to shut him up well we see Paul in Corinth and uh, good God almighty a revival break out in the house of justice and souls began to get saved and Christmas the high priest he goes and the chief ruler he slips into the service in other words he said I went to a meeting one night and my heart wasn't right and something 
got a hold of me. I was in Worcester, say High Point, just the other night, and a pastor's wife stood up and testified. She said, one night, I was on my way to the club, and while on my way to the club, something happened, and I ended up stepping into a little holiness church, which was on its way to the club. And she said, the next thing I know, said I wasn't even dressed for church. I was dressed for the club. I didn't have church on my mind. I was ready for the club. But said when the Holy Ghost got through in me, I never made it to the club. I got I joined the church and now here I am, a pastor's wife. I believe there are some people here. You were on your way somewhere, but somehow the Lord got hold to you. He saved you. He filled you with the Holy Ghost. Do I have anybody here who are glad they're saved? Glad to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, Lord, you're able to say, I was on my way somewhere else, but something, now I know it was the Holy Ghost, got hold of me. If I'm talking to you, would you praise the Lord and tell God thank you. Tell God thank you. Tell God thank you. Let him hear you on the television. Throw your hands up and say, I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. Thank you. Thank you. Christmas got, Christmas got saved. His family got saved. Hallelujah. Revival broke out and they got upset. The people who wasn't saved got upset, but God came to Paul, came to him at night in a night vision. And the first thing he told him was, be not afraid. I want to tell every believer in here, be not afraid. Don't you fear the devil. Don't you fear for your life because God's got you. Hallelujah. You're in his hands. How many know that he's a keeper and he's a way maker? You don't have to fear that report from the doctor. You don't have to fear that condition in your body. I got, when I got ready to come to church this morning, I feel the, I feel the Holy Ghost. I checked my phone and one of my friends from Washington, D.C. called me and said, bruh, pray for me. I'm in the emergency room. I called him and caught him on the phone and we prayed the prayer of faith and I heard power as it came back into him. I heard joy as it entered into him and I told him that the Lord is with you and expect a miracle. I want somebody to declare that the Lord is with me and I shall not be afraid. Oh, oh Lord, will you praise him? Will you praise him? Jesus. Tell him thank you. Tell him thank you. Tell him thank you. Don't be afraid. The Lord, hallelujah, is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid when my enemies, even my foes, gather together 
to come after me to deny to devour my flesh they stumble and they fail though a host should encamp against me in this one thing will I be confident hey I'm glad that the Lord is on my side can I get a witness in here oh won't he keep you won't he move heaven and earth to bring you out won't he deliver somebody help me preach the word here today Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In my clothes, he said, Paul, don't be afraid. And here's the thing. Don't shut up. Keep preaching. Don't be silent. Don't let them beat you into submission. Don't worry if they criticize you. Let them talk. If they mock you, let them talk. If they lie on you, let them lie. For I will hold you up. Grab somebody by the hand and say, neighbor, don't shut up. Keep on telling the world on a hill far away. Stood an old rugged cross. Keep on telling the world to the utmost, Jesus saves. Keep on telling the world that holiness is right. message of a calling the saints to arms. Hallelujah. This is a word from the Lord that says stand for me. And he's and it got good news in it. He said nobody will be able to sit on you or to hurt you. Because I have much people in this city the devil can't kill you until you fulfill God's assignment for your life. The Lord has much people in this city. You know, I'm qualified to talk about it. I bring them up. They shouldn't have done it. They, shouldn't have, they, should, they should not have. They shouldn't have been a part. 25 preachers in Raleigh 
gathered at Martin Street Baptist Church. And they held a press conference against yours truly. What was my crime? What was my sin? Why did they call the newspapers and the, uh, the, the news against me? My sin was I agreed with God on the definition of marriage and disagreed with Obama on the definition of marriage. So they got together. They got together. 25 men against one. And they didn't even call me and tell me they were having the conference. And they tried to, on my 25th year in Raleigh, 25th pastoral anniversary, it was, it was that day. And uh, you know that, 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 that anniversary banquet, that was everybody involved. God used you because that's how I miss the press conference. I was at uh, the Renaissance being celebrated. Ain't God good? He prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies. They had their press conference. I didn't know that they had it until a friend of mine called me and asked me if I wanted to be on his radio show to refute the press conference, denouncing me. I said, what press conference? And he told me, I said, man, I didn't know they had one. The preacher who hosted it within a year, he got fired. And then another preacher called me and asked me to be on the committee to try and encourage him since he got ousted. I would like to be able to tell you that I, I said, okay, I will. I said, no, no, I'm not, I'm not. You know why? You can't bless a man that God has cursed. Just like you can't curse a man that God has blessed. They shouldn't have had the meeting. And them preachers, to this day, the ones who made up the 25, they won't own it. I saw the guy who hosted it one day at, at, uh, at, uh, at a coffee shop. I would have had more respect for him had he not said anything to me. I would have thought more of him had he said, yeah, man, we tried to stop you. No, he said to me, I had no respect for him, brother. Hey, doc. Doc, you doing all right? Good to see you, doc. What? Come on, man. Now I'm doc. I would respect you better. Just the way you feel. Be a man. You, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not dark. I'm not your friend. You, you tried to destroy me. You know, he's, he, he's out. I made jurisdiction a bishop. Praise God. Oh, you sound like you're boasting. I'm making my boast in the Lord to encourage somebody. Even though the devil may be beating down on you, the enemy may be coming against you, I want to encourage you to stand for the Lord because when it's all said and done, we win. Somebody lift their voice and shout, yes. 